Hello and welcome to Trinity Talk Live, water cooler conversation from a Christian perspective. I am Ken Coughlin and we're taking a little bit of a lighter turn this week than we did last week, but one that's still filled with a lot of practical advice. And look who we've got with us today. Uh, Pastor Jay, it's almost like you never left. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be back. Yeah, but you're not in the same seat, so it's clearly a different day. It is true. That sure. is true, sure. And uh, and we, we've swapped out Pastor Chuck for somebody not quite as good looking, but, uh, and you know, half as smart, but you know, you'll do. So how you doing, Ben? I'm doing all right. <laughs> so. It's a different day for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since Ben's been on the show. Yeah. So anyway, um, normally at this point I have people introduce themselves, but... I'm just not going to do that with you guys. If you don't know who these people are, then either you don't come to the church or you haven't watched enough of these shows. So go back and watch every prior episode of Trinity Talk Live and you'll be up to speed. So, um, hey, let's get started. What do you say? Uh, We are here today to talk about something called Parenting in the Pew. You guys just did a seminar on this, or I don't know if a seminar is the right word for it. Workshop, yeah, some some term like that. um, That I thought sounded really, really fascinating and really, really helpful. So why don't we just start out, uh, before I forget, all right, this is based on a book. I want to make sure we give credit where credit is due so we don't get sued because I'm a lawyer. So <laughs> what, 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 what is this book that's based on? Somebody tell us. It's called <laughs> Parenting in the Pew. Uh, the author is Robbie Castleman and uh, it is a she, she's uh, mother of two boys, I believe. And it's really practical. She talks about her experiences raising her boys and uh, specifically in the church, and uh, some common struggles that parents feel in, in, in some anxiety that maybe we face in bringing our kids to church and, you know, giving them a side glare whenever they act up, and, you know, those, those pretty much yeah, common shared right. experiences that we all have, and, uh, you know, how we can deal with that and how to maybe shift our focus, and that's yeah. kind of what we talk yeah. about. And I came across that book a, a few years ago and did it in a previous congregation, and just really was kind of a benefit to to help out, because um, the one thing you'll hear in ministry is I hit my mic again. I apologize. But you, we he, had this I counted like five or six times I can't in the last talk with episode. My hands, so they were just. Been... <laughs> but I couldn't so, say anything. So I thought we were like being all serious. I couldn't say anything. And call you out. This episode, I'm going to call you out all every right, time fine. you hit the okay. mic. Um, but no. So <laughs> we we really these are shared experiences as as Ben was talking about, um, and I remember them as a kid too. What what it felt like to come to a you know in a worship setting where if you coughed or you made a noise and somebody went. <laughs> And looked at you, and so you know some of those. Some of that's changed, and some of it hasn't changed in, in certain settings. So um, it was a good conversation to to start to talk to have you know parents talk with each other about how they do things and that kind of stuff. But the the Robbie who wrote that she's she's a pastor's wife as well. So there's another level of expectation for her kids. Um, and but overall, I think it really just gives you some good practical pieces that you use in your own context. I mean, obviously you don't go word for word out of the book and that because our kids are different and our our congregation is different and um given the three services that we have here too each one has its own pulse and its own tone and and so some things would work in an 11 o'clock service that wouldn't be appropriate maybe in a 927 and so i mean it's 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 an interesting piece but it's only as good as you use it and it's only as good as you can apply it to your own situation i think is kind of what we what we were talking about primarily in the class so we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes where people can get the book if they want to get it. But let me ask you this question, because I know a lot of people might be looking at this and say, parenting in the pew. Well, you know, there's there's parents and there's parents. There's, you know, I just had a baby two days ago, and there's my kids are off to college, or they're now supporting me. Right. Um, so where where does where in this broad spectrum of parenthood does this book apply? Who is this for? I would say primarily it's for those who still have children in the house, but there's definitely some takeaway for even... Those who are empty nesters, because uh, we talked, I mean, talked a little bit about that in the seminar about an intergenerational approach to parenting. And that was one of the practical tools that we shared. Was, um, you know, parents are so concerned about their kids have to be quiet, they have to be silent and sit still, and they can't do anything. And uh, but really, a helpful thing would be to have those parents who have gone through it before, who maybe are missing some of that time with children and would, be, would love to have to sit with a family right. and to interact with their kids and help them in worship and kind of model that faith where maybe they may not be as receptive to their own parents, but to see somebody else, an older member of the congregation sitting with them and sharing in that worship experience with right. with the child would uh, really be beneficial in, in mentoring them in a way. 
So really, it's for uh, anybody. Yeah. And it's really just it's based on an approach versus you know how you how you parent. Um, and that's what's really unique about the book, and that I I found rewarding. It's a, it's your approach to to what it talks about in parenting in the pew. So I mean, we can. I don't know if you want to walk through the book in, in certain yeah, ways. Yeah, I mean, whatever you guys feel is best best organized. Yeah. What, what to do? What, what if we're, let's start start the advice portion of the show. I guess you could say. Great. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> uh, the biggest piece that I think we we want to make sure we stress before we run out of time is an approach to to worship. All right. So worship is an action verb. We've we've seen all those buzz kind of things in in the in the world, but worship feels different than going to church. And I think you have to, we, that's the whole point to this, is approaching, coming to this place, this space, as an opportunity to worship. Um, you know, not just coming to church, which would be a building and, and that kind of thing. So worship lends itself to um, something deeper, something, you know, more I don't know, connective with, with God, those kind of pieces. So when you prep your kids and say, we're not, instead of saying we're going to church, you know, and so for, in their mind, it'll be, I get to play with my friends and I get to go to Sunday school. And I get to, you know, eat and none of, all those things that come with with a church building and the church facility. Um, but when you when you emphasize the point that we're going to worship, then it takes on a whole different connotation, I think. Is, and that's part of the key then to this book is defining what worship really means, taking that approach to coming and, and experiencing God and, and being a part of that. I think is that, is Wait, that what, what are you saying? Worship doesn't mean food? <laughs> oh, we worship food. <laughs> Check out last week's or a couple weeks ago sermon. I talked all about it. But um, we really do worship, you know. But yeah, I mean, worship that piece of worshiping God as your heavenly Father is, is pre, you know, coming with that approach uh, to what worship truly is versus just coming to church, if that makes sense. Yeah, and another thing we emphasize with the focus shifting, like I said earlier, it kind of it focuses on shifting your definition of coming to is it coming to church or coming to worship and we start with the foundation of us to start with the parents what is the parents expectation of right. worship what is your right. current practice in worship what do you get out of worship if you come and you're focused on shushing your kids every 10 minutes making sure they're not killing each other and you got boys that are punching each other in the pew and <laughs> acting up then you're going to leave worship and not right. feel connected right. like you basically went you sat for however long, and that's going to translate to your kids. They're going to be watching what you're taking out of worship and seeing that, oh, well, this isn't really fulfilling if mom and dad are coming out of it just as exhausted as they went in. Correct. So that's the idea of changing our focus from church to worship and creating that reverence, really, and expectation. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of it is an expectation, setting the expectation for your children. Uh, there's a chapter in there where it talks about how Sunday morning begins on Saturday night, or if you come to Saturday, it's, it looks differently right. there, but it's worship begins before you enter the, the church, or before you come to worship, it begins with your expectations. Do you set your kids' clothes out the night before? Do you get them in this mindset of, yeah, we're going to, we're setting it apart, that's part of Sabbath, we're setting right. it apart and making it holy, we're coming for an experience to experience God, and uh, what does that look like, and how do we... How do we experience it ourselves, and how do we pass that on to our children? Right. And and then another crucial piece of that, which really isn't talked about in the book, but as a family systems kind of person, we are we know that we are creatures of what we've experienced prior to. So what that means is we worship the same way our parents worshipped, right? So mm -hmm. in in a culture that we grew up with, most of us grew up in a different church culture. It was more. It, at the time, it felt more reverent and more oblig, you know, more obligatory. You want to make sure that you're going and you're sitting and you're being quiet. And so it's drilled into you as a kid. So what naturally happens then when you have your own kids? Stop. Yeah. <laughs> Be quiet. You're gonna, you know, you don't want to. You you do it more for everybody else that's there because you don't want to ruin their worship experience. Because as a kid, that's what you were told: don't ruin my worship experience, or don't ruin it for for you know Sally or Joe or John or Grandpa Sam. I mean, whatever it is, you. You learn from what you've experienced, and that, believe it or not, is how you're going to end up kind of parenting in the pew. So the, before you can even apply any of the pieces in the book, you have to really understand where you are and where you, what, what you did growing up if you grew up in a church. And then there's also those that never even grew up in a church. So that, that you know, I almost feel better for them because they don't have any kind of <laughs> expectations <laughs> or any, with any baggage, baggage they're <laughs> yeah. carrying at all. So 
Um, it's, it's really kind of an interesting piece to, to understand yourself first and what you experience and how you experience worship. And, you know, cause if, like Ben said, if you're not really, if worship isn't changing you when you're coming here and you're more worried about just, you know, making sure your kids don't upset anybody else in, around you, then that's kind of the, you know, I don't want to say the wrong approach, but it's not the approach that we would take out of this book. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you talk about, you know, you know where you are and where you're coming from, but it sounds like even some of the advice that you guys are talking, uh, rattling off here, uh, could apply whether or not you're a parent or not. I mean, right. like, you know, right. knowing, being prepared, you know, looking at it as worship, mm -hmm. you know, realizing that it starts before you walk in the door, you right. know, those are, I, I think we can maybe take an inventory of some of that as well of ourselves and say, well, where are we, you know, are we modeling this ourselves? And then for those of us that are parents, you know, well, you know, we got to be walking the walk ourselves before we can talk the talk to the kids, right. so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so how would you then explain, you mentioned that you know a lot of us grew up in cultures where there um, there was we almost feel like it was obligatory. Shh, quiet, you know, and you're you're doing this as much for the people around you than anything else. Right. I got to think there's still going to be people in the pews today mm -hmm. that if you've got some kid who's even I don't even want to say acting up because I mean there's there's acting up and there's talking, mumbling, whatever. Right. You know. Right. Um, I've got kids that you know that actually interact and and people might not realize they can't hear what they're saying but lots of times my kids will like lean over to me and it'll be about something you just said right. in the sermon right you know right. but that's just that especially my daughter that's the way she learns and internalizes things is she wants to talk about them and and you know voice something that this just what you just said just made her think of um so is there anything in the book or do you guys have any wonderful insights about People who are maybe, I don't know, on the outside looking in is the right way to think, but the people that are in those pews surrounding those kids that are talking or, 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 or whatever they may be doing. Right. That's part of the shifting focus for anybody. You know, not even, it's shifting our focus as a church body, as a body of believers to focus on worship and not, this is my time, this is my experience. And I think there's more grace than we might expect. Like right. as a parent, you're your focus really intently on how your kids are acting up. Like prime example, my wife all the time, she'll come out saying, oh, the kids are so loud and disruptive, but people come up to <laughs> us and say, your kids are so great. <laughs> and so it's that perception Correct. Uh, of when, and of course we put our kids in the front pew. So we feel like everybody's watching us. Well, we are, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah. but uh, to a degree it's, um, yeah, kind of getting out of your own head for a little bit and, and realizing that sometimes a little bit of talking is okay. So it, look at it this way, you know, when, when scripture talks about train your children up in the way that they should go. And even when they are old, they will not depart from it. It doesn't say that when they're born, they're going to be automatic worshipers. They're going to be automatic Christians. You got to train them. And so look at it from the, the perspective that they're new to worship. And so how do you train them in that? There's got to be some dialogue and some of the practical advice, uh, and I always, I don't remember if I read it in here or a different <laughs> thing in preparing for the, the seminar, but one practical piece of advice is to point out if you've got a, a pre-reader, a um, child who can't quite read the words on the, on the screen yet, or if, uh, but it's, it's okay to talk to them for a while and say, when you're reading scripture, say, these are words that Jesus said, uh, and kind of point out things when we're bring, pro processing in the cross. If you're at the 927 service, explain what those things mean. And they'll get a lot more out of it. We don't realize. I think kids are smarter than we give them credit for a lot of yes, times. And they're soaking so. in everything, even if they don't seem like they're paying attention. Even if they're scribbling on uh, the bulletin, they, they may pick up on some things as well that we don't realize that they're picking up on. And as much as we can try to divert their attention to what we want them to get out of it and what we should be getting out of it, uh, I think will be beneficial. I mean, and that's it's a great point in that book is, you know, we train soccer players, we train baseball kids. We, you know, we do a lot of training for day to day activities, but we we assume that kids know how to worship when they walk in. We just don't train them. We because that for whatever reason, we don't feel like we should be training kids for worship, even though that's what we have to do is to get them to fully understand and appreciate what we are doing. We just figure it, it's a natural thing. They're going to just immerse themselves. That it says you have to train your kids for worship, and some of that's going to be intentional and in, in, in talking to them during the service and those kind of. But it's it's so that they understand going forward, and that's 
it's an interesting piece that kind of caught me, you know, at that point was, you know, do we train for worship? You know, we, <laughs> or I mean, have, do you really spend time with your kids in worship in a worship setting while it's going on? Um, and a lot of this, I think, comes from that culture of, you know, when kids used to get sent out of worship because they didn't want to be, you know, loud and heard. there was that whole, you know, children should be seen and not heard mm-hmm. approach to even worship. Um, some churches were, you know, stronger in that than others. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, it was all about the other person. You didn't want to ruin someone else's um, worship experience. And yet at that time, then it compromised these groups. So there's now a generation of kids of which Ben's a part of. Um, which I told him that um, <laughs> that grew up in you know children's church. Maybe he didn't, but it's the generation that grew up in children's church that don't know how to sit and worship because they were never trained, shown. They were encouraged to leave and go have their own kind of thing. I mean, we just we've lost a lot of that connection with worship in general. So we're having to bring it back, redefine it, reemphasize. And I think that's you know, be very intentional about it. And and that's kind of what this book does. But it's. It, it's a blanket statement to say it's a generational thing. I I, yeah. I get that because um, I'll but vouch for Ben, okay? Yeah, because I Ben and I, <laughs> I'm were, falling asleep. On yeah, no, 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 no. I think <laughs> I can't remember. Were we in your office when you showed it to me? I can't remember. But Ben and I connect over a YouTube channel called Lutheran Satire. Yes, yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. maybe I'll put a link to that one in the show notes. Right, you know what I'm talking sometime, about? Yeah. Right. There's one about children's church, yep. yes. and uh, and it basically makes. In a much more humorous way than we are, some of these exact same points. Right. So the vicar and Mr. Thompson, and he says uh, <laughs> something about creating children's church. I just hit the mic. You can put a camera on that. <laughs> uh, something about creating children's church, and he says, I believe the practices that we have, uh, which leave our pews rather quiet today, will result in leaving our pews rather empty in 20 years. Yes. Again, I mean, it's, it's humorous, but voice. it's a good point. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. They're British. So, uh, <laughs> my accent probably keeps some work. But... Um, it is. It's, it's it's poignant because you know we want to keep the kids occupied. Well, if you're not training them to worship, then they're not going to have any foundation for when they grow up and, and go out of the house. You know that that foundation isn't going to be there. And so, what do they have to hold on to when the world is pulling them away at every angle? Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's got to be part of the training. I mean, I think there's. Um, I don't know. I'm not an expert in it. I haven't read the book. You guys have. Um, but I tend to think that, you know, there's, there's a place for Sunday school and that, t- that type of education uh, done right. And that's a show for another day, maybe. Um, and, but at the same time, we can't uh, forego the worship experience for the kids because there's a different type of training that needs to be done right. there. And, and maybe it's just in taking the kids out and training them on worship elements mm-hmm. as well. I mean, there's nothing that says we have to just have coloring books and do a quick little story, and that's their children's church. I mean, you can teach them how to be acolytes and light candles and have the whole kind of setup and everything like that as well. I mean, there is there is an element to doing that. And again, some churches have done that and some haven't. And it's just, it's really the, the approach, A, of the pastors and the, the leadership in the congregation. You know, a lot of the leadership, and again, blanket statement coming, a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the leadership will be, you know, the, the kids are the future of our congregation, we just don't want them in here while we're worshiping. I mean, you know, and that's, they just don't connect in that way. So if you truly believe that the kids are, then invest in them, train them, figure out how to coexist with them in worship while you're doing that. And some of it's a pastoral driven piece. You have to have open pastors that are, are okay with kids getting up and screaming in the middle of the, the you know, the message and you just roll with that. Um, and you have to foster that environment with, with the congregation as well. And, and that just doesn't happen overnight. And it didn't happen overnight getting to this place either. So uh, it's understanding the church is still messy and it's still going to have its own little, you know, nuances and each service kind of has that, like I said, that different feel, but engaging these kids in worship is only going to, to help them down the road and, and help Christianity, I think, if you will, it's going to help fulfill that great commission piece. That's for, um, and just really make sure that they're, uh, that they're engaged in in what worship truly means. You know, Ben, you made a point in one of your earlier, earlier episodes that you were on the show, and I don't remember what the topic was, but I, this has stood out to me as you talking about Pollyannaism mm. when people come into church yeah. and that we have this idea that we need to put on a face, you know, the best face, which is a completely deceptive face because that's not who we really are. That's not what's really going on in our life. 
And 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 I don't know why it made me think of it, but when you said you know the you know, church is is messy, well yeah, because it's filled with messy people. Absolutely. And Absolutely. if we're honest with ourselves, you know we're messy people. We're going to expect um, there's going to be some mess in our worship service, and that's honest. There's something honest about that. Mm -hmm. But when we try to get rid of the mess in our worship right. services, it almost it's, it reminds me of the Pollyannaism. We're trying to put on a face. Like we're so much more, you know, holy than every than everybody else. Look how perfectly orchestrated our worship service is, and is that the way you really should be presenting yourself to God? I mean, I don't I think know. A good uh, a good skit. Maybe we can do this. Is <laughs> what does your Sunday morning worship look like, and what does your Sunday morning at the house getting ready for worship look like? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put those side by side. You know, you're sitting there. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Flash, flashback to uh, <laughs> you know, kind of. You're on the wrong feet. Uh, what is wrong with you? One of the comedians we were watching on YouTube uh, yesterday, I can't remember which one it was. Now we've watched so many. Uh, made the point is like whoever wrote "Easy Like Sunday Morning" has never tried to get their kids to church in the morning. Or doesn't have kids in general. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. You're a Christian. Well, I don't know if he's Christian or not, but he wasn't one of the ones who was outwardly Christian. That was Brad Upton. Oh, it was okay. dry bar comedy. Well, we've given credit where credit, credit is due. <laughs> so, all right, so let's assume now that uh, I don't know how much time we got left here. We got a, a few minutes left here. You've gotten out the things that you wanted to make absolutely sure you got out about that book right. before we ran out of time. Good, done. Now, what is there? What what's the next the, the next tier down? The thing you got a few minutes left. What else you want to get out about the advice in, that you guys have been giving in your workshop or in the book that we haven't gotten to say yet? Just a couple of you know practical. I think. People are looking for practical advice when you talk about this. So how do you know, <clears throat> what does it look like when I've got my two-year-old who can't sit still? And, and how do I create that balance of bringing them into worship, but also understanding they're, they're two years old and they can't, they don't have the attention span. So uh, just a couple of practical things that you can do. Um, things that are, you, one, one that I saw was uh, bring like pipe cleaners or something. It's a quiet thing for them to, to play with, but it kind of occupies them. But like I said earlier, they're still soaking in things, whether they let on or not. You know, mm -hmm. They're still going to be hearing. They're still going to be uh, seeing things. But something small for them to, to fiddle with that doesn't really make a whole lot of noise that you can be comfortable with. Pipe cleaners are great. Uh, those little, um, <clears throat> they're called like little tangle. It's like a little plastic thing, tangle right, rope right. or whatever. Yep. Um, those, are, those are fun and for them to kind of play with. But also, um, like we said, with pointing out things. And I think a good compromise that we do here at Trinity with uh, especially our contemporary services is we have the children in worship up until the message and then they go out and they have their own kind of message. And sometimes through the beginning of the message if someone forgets to dismiss them. <laughs> right. right, Pastor Jay? Who's done that? I don't know. Right. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah, so they can still be getting all of that worship uh, yeah. being brought into that area. And again, you know, Looking at worship, what is worship? You know, a lot of times we equate music with worship. That's this is worship music. Well, it can get us into a place of worship, but worship is more than just music. Music is the vehicle, uh, is a vehicle that can lead us into worship. But how do we structure that outside of even the congregation, outside of when we come together in church? But how do we take that with us when our children, when we go with our children? What are the talking points that we can have with our kids about? what we just experienced in worship and how do we continue that on for the rest of the week? What are some tools that you have at home to create a worship environment? Do you do a devotion with your children at night and create a, a set time every day? Just like, you know, yes, we have a Sabbath to, to keep that holy and keep that separate, but we should be every, every day having a time to be, to spend with God. And so we should be doing the same with our kids, modeling that with them, um, we have, uh, you know, Right Now Media is a great tool. We use that here. Uh, I was just, I shared in the seminar that uh, we do that with our kids. We have uh, also the Bible app for kids. That's really great. It's um, it's a Bible, it's like the Bible app, but it's got, uh, it's really interactive and they go through all of the stories and everything. So they, we do that for their nightly devotion. And then on Friday nights, we let them stay up and they watch like an episode of Superbook or Veggie Tales or something uh, as kind of like the mm -hmm. devotion, but they you know, look forward to that and create something special and you know, knowing your kids, what do they respond to? Um, what you know, what kind of gets them driven and how can you use that? How can you leverage that? Uh, which I think is a great thing that Pastor Jay has, has brought here to Trinity is the box. You know, taking ordinary mundane things. Now, I know this past week you've had 
an easy one. I got an easy they got a cross. A softball. What's a cross? Box. How's but that anything, <laughs> yeah, anything that can be kind of tied to it. How do we look for Well, and I think things. that's not to cut you off, but I think that's a big part of defining what worship is, yes. too. Because, you know, when we say we're, we're worshiping, we tend to put it in the context of just a church setting, right? Mm -hmm. But worship is different. Worship is stewardship as well. It is, you know, using everything that we have, all these mon mundane things that, that lift up God and show forth God's glory. That is worship. I mean, the <laughs> when I was going through seminary, and and it was it, it was challenging at, at its point. But the one thing that I, one of the biggest pieces I took out of, out of seminary is when my New Testament professor said, "Is the offering the high point of your worship experience?" And I went, Ugh. <laughs> right, because it's money and it's wrapped around that. And it's a, but that is that sacrificial act of giving to God, and it was the high point of the obviously the Jewish traditions, those kind of things under the law. But we don't focus on the law so much anymore. So now we've kind of lost, I think, lost that that giving piece. You know, for it's a sacrificial piece, and not even even if you don't use that whole ten percent number, it's the, the act of the sacrificing of giving back, and so. Is that the high point of your worship service? For some people, it do is. People even think of that as do they even think about yeah. it as worship? And so that, again, that's that whole Obligatory. stewardship piece, yeah. right? It's it's yeah, it's just a way we got to keep the, the the lights on. We got to pay the staff, da da da. But that sacrifice piece, you know, do we look at giving our offering as a sacrifice? And there's a whole sermon series there. I think we're going to do at some point. It's coming <laughs> so, if, if you want. In sometime, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, but really, that's that was eye opening for me. Because I never thought of the offering as, I mean, call it an offering. Right. I mean, it's, that's what we call it. But we never really talk about it in terms of, of worship. And so that's, again, defining what worship is, which is what we kind of talked about. It's you got to have a fuller, broader stewardship understanding of what worship is, not just a Sunday morning experience either or Saturday night. So, again, understanding those pieces, it, it's going to have to help redefine what the word worship means. Can you do me a quick favor? Mm -hmm. Because... Ben mentioned um, the box yes. that you do. Yeah. And I do happen to know that we do have some viewers of this show that okay. aren't members here. Sure. And so okay. can you tell them what, what was Ben talking about? What do you do? The box is something that I, I can't even remember where I picked it up, but it was years ago, and it's been something I've done at every congregation, the four or five I've been a part of. Um, it is simply a box about yay big. Depending, it started actually smaller. <laughs> then it got a little <laughs> bigger, and I don't think, because kids have to carry it. But every every week during a children's message time, the, the kids... We'll take this box home over the week, and they'll find something to put into it. And their charge is, or their goal is, to bring it back, and we find a way to talk about God through that. So um, initially, when I first started, it was kind of a game. How can we stump Pastor Jay? Because Pastor Jay would come up with it and, and be like, oh, let's uh, can da 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 But it, eventually, Pastor Jay got smart and said, <laughs> here's what you get to do as kids when you do that. So now, but it's really been a great piece for the, from the feedback I've gotten from parents is, because they're walking around their house all day and they're trying mm -hmm. to figure out, or all week trying to figure out what they get to put in the box and how it, you know, how it's how it talks about God and how they can look at that. So what are they intentionally or don't realize they're doing? They're looking at everything that they have in their house, all their toys, all their you know their wash everything that that they do as coming from God as a gift from God. So they don't understand that they're getting immersed in stewardship. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really kind of how that started. It was really just a, kind of a fun thing to stump Pastor Dave, and now it's. It's a ministry piece where they're they're seeing, um, and the kids argue about who gets to take it next week. I mean, eventually, once everybody's had their turn, that's where the fun begins because they're like, "I want it, I want it." I, want it. I mean, they really it's it's, it's a lot of fun um, when they do that. But we'll see if we continue it after the summer. It, it really came. Out, um, I did it as a children's message in other congregations, but this one kind of came out of necessity because we do have a vehicle for the kids to go and learn. But during the 927, we just didn't have enough teachers. And so we we're like, well, let's just put this in here and see where it fits. And, and I think the kids are, are enjoying it. Um, but, it, you know, it's been it's a very intentional piece to, to help kids understand that everything they have is connected to God. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what, what that is. It brings the them into the worship service, too. The worship service. Great, so. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, believe it or not, time has fly, <laughs> flown. Um, I want to give one more shout out to the book here. The book is Parenting in the Pew, uh, Guiding Your Children into the Joy of Worship by Robbie Castleman. Um, again, we'll put the, a link in the show notes to where you could pick that up. And uh, I think you guys would recommend not just reading the book, but maybe working, to, working through it in some kind of a group setting as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that'd be excellent. 
Um, if you are a member here at Trinity and you didn't get to be part of the workshop, then um, just knock on their doors randomly any old time you want to, and I'm sure they'll be happy. We may do another one. There were a few folks that weren't able to, you know, to be a participant in that this time and would like to do it again, so we may host another, well, that'd be another awesome. piece. Just that'd so, be excellent. Kind of a thing. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all. If you did like this episode, do me a favor. Go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. Ben's over there. He doesn't realize I'm using this camera angle, so he's not on camera, but he's still putting his thumbs up too. So take my word for it. Thanks, Pastor Jay. Uh, <laughs> my peripheral vision is still pretty good. Um, and uh, do me a favor. Go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on everything we've got coming up. Um, and also share this video so that other people can be... Uh, educated and be helped by these resources. Uh, we do have a uh, Facebook page here at Trinity Talk Live Podcast. You can give us a like on there. And that's where we post things about we got what we got coming up. And you can give us feedback there as well as far as what you would like to see. Uh, and we are going to be back next week. Next week, we are taking on the topic of how working in the business world as a Christian. And uh, we've got two folks coming on the show next week, uh, Rick Grant and Mark Coger. And they're both, uh, shall we say, self-employed business people. They have their own businesses, um, and or or they're business people. I don't I don't know enough. I, I don't know enough about Rick's business. You guys could probably fill me in, or I'll learn more next week, I guess. Um, but they're going to talk to us a little bit about you know life in the professional world, you know, out there in the world, so to speak. Um, and living it out according to and consistent with their Christian convictions. So it's going to be a real good good episode, I think. So one last time, I will say thank you again for Pastor Jay. We've gotten you on now. I can't remember how. I've lost count of how many episodes. I mean, you're just racking them up here over the summer. So it's a good thing. It is, but I don't think I have you booked at all for anything else right now. So we're going to have to work okay. that out. So, and Ben, I, I, I joked before we went on the air that I'm just going to start calling you the co-host, you know, because you're on all the time, but I really appreciate it. And there's a reason I keep asking you to come on because, well, you have insightful, important things to say. So now I've said enough. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Tied into the episode there. Um, so. Adam Reed. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching. God bless. In your word we